uh, uh, he has been working with uh, visual pragmatics of scientific diagrams, uh, with uh, a lot of other cultural yeah, manifestations, uh, if I may say. Uh, and currently, he's working on the biosemiotics of episodic memory in, in animals, animals in general. So uh, he has also been doing a, a lot of uh, very nice work as, as a, a freelance science journalist. And uh, today, he will uh, uh, give this presentation entitled Paris Goes Interstellar, the hyperbolic continuum and the diagram of the it. So please, Oscar. Uh, you, have, you have to put your Hello, everyone. Just give me one second before I start, I'll just uh, get my presentation going. If I could just do it. Uh, Okay. Right here. Right here. In the meantime, I'm curious who is following us from Mexico or somewhere else in the world. We have a lot of people. Yeah, raise your virtual hand for, for me, please. <laughs> oh, finally. Yes. So do we have any race hands? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got a lot of so at least two or three. Uh, I think uh, our, our good friend Julio was also somewhere. Julio Horta. Cool. So can people online tell me if they are watching the thing that I'm watching? Yes. OK, great. Uh, so for those who don't know, Senor Salon is some sort of an independent uh, get together a space for semioticians, and it somehow originated in the semiotics department in Tartu, Estonia. And uh, so now this is just one more of this series of presentations. And the topic, I just remind you, is this continuity or synechism in one of the co founders of semiotics at large, that is Pers. And well, my presentation has like two main goals. First, uh, because I know that there are not uh, non semioticians in our audience. And this thing is going to be posted in YouTube, right? Yes. According to the organizers. So, uh, so the first goal would be just to be an invitation, some sort of a dissemination of funny pieces of knowledge that we take for granted in semiotics. But in the eyes of a wider audience, it looks so esoteric and so weird. Uh, so it's like an invitation for people to get interested somehow in semiotics through this cool uh, topic that is time. Uh, I love this topic. And the second goal of my presentation would be, okay, to go more into detail uh, when it comes to why on earth time is a, such as, uh, an important topic in semiotics. Because as you know, uh, any serious or respectable philosopher and scientist must take into account time in order to account for processual phenomena. Uh, and we have Wittgenstein, we have uh, Ray Mass. We have, uh, I'm forgetting most of them. So huh? It was also like in temporality. Oh, Jeanette, and so on and so forth. And of course, Peirce was no exception. Even Wittgenstein was uh, into time. <clears throat> so the title of my presentation basically uh, is a trap. It's to entice you into something that is not going to be quantum physics. So, very well, let me just measure time. And okay, here we go. Oh yeah, <laughs> get busy. So for people online, uh, yeah, if possible, could you please uh, maximize your, uh, yeah, my presentation, I mean, the slides that I'm showing, because otherwise, if you're like watching me and the presentation somehow. So yeah, just maximize your screen for a better view of what I'm going to explain. So first, an introduction on why PERS, right? Uh, and why is it relevant to this topic? 
of time. So for those who don't know, uh, PERS was one of the pioneers of cybernetics, even before Cloud and uh, Shannon. <coughs> oh, yeah. Uh, now, maybe it's something a little better. So he basically uh, discovered, uh, as he is showing this letter to one of his students, that machines uh, with circuits could perform logical operations. Charles Peirce also created the most accurate uh, representation, bidimensional representation of the earth. That is known as this, I don't know how to pronounce it correctly, the quinconcial projection of the earth. Also Peirce is known for being one of the first experimental scientists to tie a unit of distance, in this case, a matter, uh, to an absolute standard, that is the wavelength. And he also is known for being one of the first in attempting to measure the shape and uh, extent the boundaries of the Milky Way using the brightness of stars. So how cool is that? Oh yes, and you can, you can see here, uh, yeah, this uh, piece of work that is called photometric researches, where this is explained. Peirce was also one of the pioneers in measuring uh, gravity. So this is an example of one of the devices that he used. He kind of uh, built them and personalized them so he could make his own measurements on gravity. Uh, yeah. And yeah, this is a very cool thing. So Peirce was also a mathematician, as you know. He was one of the pioneers in proving the existence of infinite collections, independently, of course, from Dedekind and Cantor. And as we know, most famously, at least in this part of the world, Peirce is the co-founder of semiotics, the science or the discipline studying science systems, right? And also the father of pragmatism. And yes, this is just a different ways of modeling semiosis, what we call in semiotics, semiosis. This is not very important right now, but for those of you who don't know, maybe online, uh, semiosis is basically a logical influence between some uh, set of three things. One that we call the representamen or the sign that is substituting or standing for something other than itself. It can be basically anything that is called the object. And this uh, relation is basically given by something we call interpretant or interpretation, if you will. Uh, so yeah, anyhow, because I will be using this word a lot, semiosis, right? And these are different ways of diagrammatically representing this triadic influence that is semiosis. Okay, so now the cool part of the presentation before the boring part. Uh, so as I promised, I will be speaking about a little bit of science fiction and why Peirce in a way uh, for, uh, what's the word, he anticipated somehow many of the paradoxes that physicists and experimental scientists would face when it comes to measuring time at quantum scales and at uh, relativistic scales. So far, so good. Oh, that's me from the future. <laughs> that's me from the future telling me not to do it. Okay. So who likes back to the future? Raise your digital hands, please. And your real hands, no? Yeah. <clears throat> so what we learned from back to the future is that yes, traveling in time. Oh, surprise, surprise. Also necessarily involves traveling in space. They got that right because space is not space, but space time, right? And they also say that past, present, and future are causally connected and simultaneously connected to it. So yeah, one influences the other instantaneously, basically. And they also basically argue that the past influences the future, A influences B, but not the other way around, like under normal circumstances. That's the, the logical premise of the movie, right? And then we have this, uh, <clears throat> the flux capacitor, this cool device that they uh, invent in the movie, powered by plutonium, makes possible time travel. And it was hypothesized as a diagram first, ironically as a triadic uh, diagram by this Dr. Emmett Brown, right? And then uh, 
this is just a funny reminder. This is not going to be important right later, but anyhow. Uh, so yeah, past, present, and future add not parts or like uh, individual parts or meteorological parts of time, but this is different expressions of stage in a relativistic process. And this uh, resonates with what Joshua was saying earlier. I will say it again, different expressions of stage in a relativistic process. And finally, we learn from back, in the back to the future that time has its own laws, its own regularities, and breaking these regularities would imply a logical paradox. In other words, time and logic are like deeply connected, right? We cannot account for logic without time and vice versa. Now, uh, we move to dark. Any fans of dark? The German yes, yes, TV yes. series, one here. Any other? Yes, Please raise your digital hands. One more. Okay, Julio Ardoño, perfect. Yeah, I knew it. The best okay. series ever. Yes, I know. So <clears throat> from dark, we learned that time cannot be changed. Uh, and we are just these witnesses of a causal loop repeating itself, right? Like there is not, even if there is free will, we cannot actually influence like thermodynamically um, the output of events somehow. Anyhow, then uh, in this series, for those of you poor people who haven't seen this great series, the, best series. Uh, the year 86 created somehow the state of affairs in, in 2019, but in 1953, the state of affairs created the state of affairs in 1986, sorry. So anyhow, it's like a causal loop that goes on forever. And this means that time is this ultimate logical law that is uh, in the series equated with God. This is very interesting. Oh yeah. And then uh, the machine that makes possible time travel because there is also time travel in dark is this apparatus that was built by this uh, um, clock, clock maker. I don't know how to make it. Yes. So, and it was inspired by a book that comes from the future. And then this is powered by cesium isotopes that create wormholes that allow you to bypass space time by 33 years in the future or into the past. Oh, by the way, 33 years is my age. And then uh, future states influence past states. So, there is retrocausality, like in quantum physics. So this how, somehow breaks the intuitive idea that past doesn't influence the future. Mm -hmm. So they take into account this like quantum mechanic uh, uh, jargon and lore. Next, uh, let's move on to interstellar. I hope there are fans of interstellar, whatever. Uh, raise your digital hands. Thank you. Okay, so in this movie, for those who didn't watch it, um, there's this thing, the Tesseract or the Hypercube that's similarly to this, uh, the, like the DeLorean or similarly to this uh, clockwise device. This was created by like um, higher, higher beings, these bulk beings with timeless access to higher dimensions and basically works as a time travel machine. And it works by manipulating gravitational waves as means of communication. So basically gravity somehow is like this ripples in space and time that can uh, reach the boundaries of the universe, whatever time or space it is. That's like the premise more or less, if I got it correct. And uh, this thing, this crazy thing exists beyond this event horizon of a supermassive black hole. Very well, but now, Getting a bit more serious, um, yeah, I um, I tricked you into coming to this presentation so that you could just uh, have a little glimpse of why in semiotics, the relationship between time and mind is very important to understand from different disciplines, like from philosophy, from psychology, from neurobiology, and so many disciplines. Uh, yeah, so in the case of semiotics, as I was mentioning earlier, Peirce is like the big guy right now. And I will just uh, mention these three quotes that summarize somehow what I'm about to tell you, like in depth, hopefully, if I get to present like in a half an hour. So this time thing is our form of intuiting logical connections. Okay, logic there again, 
or he also says time is the image of a logical sequence. So somehow he implies that time is perceivable or uh, perceptible, or that somehow our perceptions unfold over time, or the other way around, maybe. And finally, time is this form under which logic, specifically the relation of logical dependence, presents itself to intuition. Yeah, so for Peirce, time is a form of intuition like we can't. Space, time, and consciousness for Peirce are three forms of continua or formal intuitions. That's like one of his main um, premises or hypotheses in metaphysics. And if anyone uh, doesn't have the time to go through all this presentation or, yeah, I just get lost, you can always come back to this great, great book by Andrew Reynolds. And basically, it is this very in-depth revision of Peirce's postulates on time. In this chapter, the irreversibility of psychics, not physics, psychics, that's what Peirce used to call uh, somehow psychology or the psychical sciences. Uh, this is what interests me in the presentation. Mental time, phenomenological time, psychological perception of time, if you will. Not necessarily physical time because I am not a physicist by any means. And what I'm about to tell about time, uh, yeah, don't take it uh, seriously because, yeah, I'm not a physicist. So I would be just making some uh, observations on phenomenological time, okay? Now, so verses in this analysis of time paper. So in order to analyze the law of mind, what he called the law of mind, whatever, we must begin by asking what the flow of time consists in. And OK, just one parenthesis here. Every time that I mention the word mind, uh, for practical purposes, we humans, we mortal, mortal human beings, we can think of it as memory. Uh, yeah, it is a bit more up to date, I would say, term that we will be using mind. But in my case, I argue that mind is basically memory. Anyhow, uh, OK, so here are like six or seven premises that I will be trying to explain in the manuscripts and papers, of course. One, time is a relational system with its own natural laws, as we saw with Back to the Future, so they got that right. Uh, also, mind's temporal logic is different from physical time. That's very important. Physical time is different from the mind's temporal perception of time. However, number three, mind is able to infer logically the actual temporal relationships in the world. We are not crazy. Time might be, time might be some sort of a metaphor, metaphorical illusion, if you will, uh, to explain thermodynamics, but we are not crazy and we can actually infer things about how time works. Number four, according to Peirce, perceiving time involves three types of feelings or intellectual purpose. That's where, that's where uh, phenomenology comes in, right? And surprise, surprise, these three types of feelings are, do you know them? Perception, retrospection, and prospection. Okay, perception, retrospection, and prospection. And they have different names, but it's basically the same. Now, mind or memory, in this case, requires infinitesimal but connected intervals of time in order to operate. So this is where the continuity comes in. Uh, yeah. Mental processes are not instantaneous. They require some sort of like unfolding over time in order to operate. That's why taking a decision takes time. Making a decision takes time, yeah. And number six, there might be what Peirce called a general type of consciousness, keeping track of different intervals of time. So very important notice here, Peirce did not live to see the advent of neurocognitive sciences as we know them. So he didn't know uh, about episodic memory. He didn't know about semantic memory, sensorial memory, procedural memory, working memory, and so on and so forth. But only if he knew, right? Only if he knew. But uh, number six, basically, this general type of consciousness, nowadays we can confidently say that indeed uh, it is called chronisthesia, and it's basically one phenomenological trait of episodic memory. And I, will, I won't get into that right now, just now. Okay, so far so good. 
are, are still people breathing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, I'm going a bit too fast maybe, but uh, I have to speed up. There is no time. Okay, I will just uh, use my MA thesis as some sort of a reference for what I'm about to say. And right now I'm going to list a series of papers and chapters written by Peirce, where he actually mentions time in a very interesting way or another. <clears throat> uh, okay, so in this paper, The Origin of the Universe, he pondered that time is something systematic, having its own organization, laws, and regularities, as we have been saying. And similarly, in the problems of metaphysics, he further speculates on the reality of time and its tendency to make events progress in one direction. I can hear myself somewhere like a loop. Uh, okay. Yeah. So nowadays we know this for a fact. Uh, this is the uh, the tendency to uh, physical chemical reactions to unfold and what we know as thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics. So actually, yes, uh, time has this tendency to make events it progress in one direction. However, at the quantum scale, this is a whole different story. Okay, then in the law of mind, I mean, in one of the versions of the law of mind, uh, he proposes that time is a hyperbolic continuum. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, in a sense, that the infinitely past and the infinitely future are distinct and do not coincide. So basically this uh, amounts to say that time is a system where the ending of a causal chain of events does not diachronically affect its beginning. Okay, so uh, like in Back to the Future, the future doesn't necessarily influence the, the past. Uh, let's say in a, in a different way. A spatiotemporal event A, causally influences its subsequent event B. In like manner, B will influence its subsequent event C. However, C will never causally affect B and B will never affect A. That's like the common sense understanding of time, right? In the macroscopic uh, sense. And in short, Peirce with this example says that the present is connected with the past. So the present is connected with the past by a series of real infinitesimal steps. And then he proceeds to provide a mathematical proof and arguments for his triadic understanding of temporal relationships. Oh, not yet. So Peirce also observed, however, that a physical event could, in theory, work backwards, OK? Maybe we could artificially invert the spin and momentum of a particle, reverse a swinging pendulum, <clears throat> or regress an hourglass. So basically, Peirce makes this uh, yeah, anticipation of what we understand as uh, mirror symmetry, like the conservation of energy law, right? This law of conservation of energy tells us that any state of affairs in a physical system can be reversed with previous state of affairs if given the proper conditions and nothing would be lost according to this uh, law that I understand very poorly. But then, um, okay, so this thing now, yes, in topical geometry means, or according to Peirce, it means that the ontological difference between a past state and a future state is non-existent when it comes to this energy conservation law. And although this seems to contradict this intuitive idea that the past and the future are distinct, like back to the future, uh, for Peirce, this means that the mind's temporal phenomenology, the phenomenology of time in our memory, is somehow different from the virtual symmetry of physical time. In other words, as, as Peirce puts it on the signs and the categories, and I'm about to show you a quote, and I will read it fully, so people who are online, please follow along. So he says, if all the velocities were reversed at any instant, everything would go just Sorry, go on, just the same. Only time going backwards, as it were. Everything that had happened would happen again in reverse order. This seemed to me, uh, this seemed to me to be strong arguments to prove that temporal causation, 
a very different thing from physical dynamical action is an action upon ideas and not upon existence. Yeah, so time is complicated, right? <laughs> then, uh, oh, but not yet. So my current interest in this uh, more theoretical part of the presentation, so my interest lies in this fact that memory and more particularly episodic memory, this autobiographical capacity to remember the past and imagine the future uh, is somehow irreversible and operates under the formal intuition that past is indeed different from the future because we understand the causal flow that involves going from past to future. Then Hurst goes on to argue in analysis of time that, one more quote, one of the most marked features about the law of mind or memory, as I say, is that it makes time to have a definite direction or flow from past to future. Now, the relationship of past to future is in reference to the law of mind, different from the relation to future to past. This makes one of the great contrasts between the law of mind and the law of physical force, where there is no more distinction between the two opposite directions in time than between moving northward and moving southward. Okay, in other words, basically, uh, he just reinforces this idea that phenomenological time is different from actual physical time, at least in like in purely physical systems. Okay, so I will try to make a, a summary of what I've been telling you so far. So uh, for first then, Retrospection, thinking about the past, does not make the mind side, what we call the mind side, to be rewound as a tape, or neither to work in reverse as an engine, nor be inverted as an hourglass. So when we remember the past, we don't have to uh, play the tape like backwards. We don't see each other as like walking in reverse, all the way up linearly until what we want to remember, right? We just jump arbitrarily into this scene, simulate the scene, and we replay it in a forward fashion. That's what Perse is telling us, this irreversibility of memory. It's not that we have to be like an engine or a hieroglass or a pendulum, right? Uh, okay, but of course he didn't know episodic memory. I mean, the neurocognitive evidence for episodic memory yet. Yeah, um, okay, I'll try to speed up. Very well. So in this paper, causation and force, um, hers, oh no, sorry, not in causation and force, in this one, number eight, law of mind, early try. He says, so then what does the difference between past and future consists in? If physics says that there is no difference in terms of energy, right? Then Per says, okay, past ideas, are those which are associated with consciousness. Future ideas are those which are not so associated yet. So the flow of time by which the future becomes past consists in the continual increase of associations or the tendency of thoughts to become more and more connected. And this is like one of the most important quote, quotes of tonight for me, because basically he is arguing and just letting us remember that Ontologically speaking, the past doesn't go like forwards. It's not like the past turns into present and the present turns into future. No, it's the future that turns into the present and the present that turns into the past. And interestingly enough, this is a, a motion that moves from the future into the past, like even if it's metaphorically speaking or linguistically speaking. Uh, but this reveals this anticipatory nature of Perse's pragmatism. So Perse's semiotics and pragmatism are based on the idea that life, meaning, and all the things we do somehow are anticipatory. That's why we are different somehow. The causality, um, these teleological processes in life are anticipatory and are not a plain victim, so to speak, of thermodynamics. Okay, but this is a different thing. Very well. Where were we? Number eight. 
אוקיי. יאה, ספידינג אופ. To get to a bit more uh, interesting part, because to be honest, I was preparing a lot of uh, in-depth semiotic Persian stuff, but I know that we don't have. Uh, I mean, it's almost 9 p.m. We are tired. People online, maybe I don't know, you're tired as well, <clears throat> and some people are not so that into semiotics. So anyhow, bear with me a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to time and thought. So, first, next premise as put in this paper, time and thought, is that mind, memory in my words, so memory requires infinitesimal but connected intervals of physical time in order to operate as a continuous system. As he says, it takes time for ideas to be present to the mind. They are present during a time, and they're present by means of the presence of the ideas which are in the parts of that time. Nothing is therefore present to the mind in an instant, but only during a time. So basically here, uh, the takeaway message with this quote is that we cannot think of a phenomenological time as completely uh, free from the constraints, the informational, physical, material constraints that thermodynamics uh, yeah, laid upon us because we're material beings, right? So our brains are made of matter, and that means that they have limitations for information processing. Even though memory cannot be reduced completely to uh, physical processes. So yeah, mm. very well. We're almost done with the quotes, I promise. Then, where were we? Mm -hmm. So now, in the law of mind, he says, consciousness must then essentially cover an interval of time. For if it did not, we could gain no knowledge of time and not merely no veracious cognition of it, but no conception whatever. We are therefore forced to say that we are immediately conscious through an infinitesimal interval of time. Again, the same thing. Okay. Now, uh, so, so far, what I've been trying to somehow show in how persons approach time is that consciousness, or nowadays we call consciousness in terms of uh, awareness. Oh. I think we have to mute someone online. Yes. Or is it me from the future again? Mm. Very well. So I was saying, uh, so yeah, different types of awareness provided by different types of memory um, involve a flow of inference that presupposes continuity, duration, and subjectivity. Subjectivity, by that, by that I mean a point of view, a perspectival point of view. We cannot speak about time without an observer, an interpreter, a measurement, right? And this is very important because this links semiotics to physics, right? We cannot speak about uh, relativistic systems or about quantum systems without measurements and without points of view. Anyhow, very well. Okay, I will skip this and then go to the conception of time. No, I will skip this and go to the last quote, yeah. So this quote from, comes from a paper that is called Questions Concerning Certain Faculties Claimed for Man. It's a very famous paper, but I will just quote this uh, for the current purposes. So he argues that, okay, there might be a consciousness of the events that happened in a whole day or in a whole lifetime. And according to this, two parts of a process separated in time, though they are absolutely separate in so far as, they, <clears throat> as there is a consciousness of the one from which the other is entirely excluded, are yet so far not separate that there is a more general consciousness of the two together. So basically he's arguing that 
according to uh, his experimental approach, according to, to his philosophical approach, uh, there is some way, somehow, our brains, our minds, perceiving this relationship across time. And that's when the concept of memory comes in. He didn't know about episodic memory yet. He didn't know about circadian rhythms yet. He didn't know about many, many different neurocognitive processes nowadays we understand. But he was anticipating no less and no more than an, an episodic memory, what we nowadays call uh, chronistitia, one aspect of episodic memory. And this is just a, a paper that I wanted to show uh, somehow to exemplify how nowadays we speak about this consciousness that keeps track of the events of a whole day or in a whole life, that is long-term memory. That is episodic memory and cute image of some brain uh, activity here related to chronesthesia. And I will be just providing this uh, a bit more concrete example of how can then we understand mind in terms of memory. So nowadays we have this very uh, funny word or term, mental time travel. But mental time travel actually is a very interesting thing in terms of neurocognitive processes because it is an ability of performing retrospective past-oriented thinking and prospective or future-oriented thinking according to a sequence of mental scenes or mental imagery, mental qualia, so to speak. And this mental time travel thing gives temporal experience a sense of a directional trajectory. So maybe to begin with, uh, the way we understand physical time travel comes from our fallible way of traveling in time, right? So the way our mind travels in time somehow is fallible and it's not perfect and it's not isomorphic to the actual time travel. And maybe that's where the mistakes come from because we think of time in terms of our mind's time, right? But that's a different topic for another presentation. If you want to know more about everything that I've been saying like in really, really nerdy Persian semiotic type terms, uh, you can go to this uh, thesis that I wrote that I was, I went, I was reading uh, a biosemitic phenomenology of time in episodic memory, where I go in depth into these things and how we can understand them with experimental evidence. Because Paris, unfortunately, could not have uh, fMRIs and all these things, right? Now, moving on a bit, uh, how, how am I doing on time? Uh, you have done around six, seven minutes. Okay. okay, yeah, okay, so we're doing good. So um, I would just stand with a more updated note on how we semioticians nowadays continue speaking about time because Persia was the beginning of the 20th century. And now, how do we speak about time in the beginning of the 21st century? Uh, I recommend you or anyone interested in how we actually research time in semiotics to check out this paper by Andrew Young. And it's, I would say, the greatest paper I've ever read in my whole life. Now, according to this paper, I will just summarize it briefly. Yeah, he basically resumes Peirce and he discovers that yes, indeed, perception is mediated by semiosis. You know, this funny word that I mentioned at the beginning, this interpretative process. This interpretative process or semiosis involves both efficient and final causes, so mechanistic forces, so to speak, but also teleological or intentional aspects of mind. Number three, perception involves two different arrows of time. And perception is a bidirectional flow through three semiosic moments. And I will be just showing this very, very interesting time travel model, so to speak, mental time travel model. And it's where we could somehow condense all the pragmatics, all the semiotics uh, of time travel as understood currently by semiotics. Uh, I won't have the time to explain it, but again, I invite you to check it out in my thesis or in the paper of Andrew Tian. And this basically what shows, as I mentioned before, is that future turns into the present and the present turns into the past and not the other way around. That's why mind is anticipatory and not a freaking machine. Very well. So yeah, I will try to just skip this. 
Okay, so do you remember that at the beginning I mentioned that for pairs, time, space, and consciousness are formal intuitions, like, like as Kant, like in Kant, right? So this means that they are continuum. Uh, I mean, time is a continuum, space is a continuum, and consciousness or awareness is a continuum. So semiosis, to conclude, somehow is this cooperation between the world or universe, uh, the mind, and signs, sign vehicles, representaments. So what a surprise. It's not only material or only psychological, but a combination of these three things, basically. Nowadays, we know, yes, that time, OK, somehow seems to have a direction forwards or backwards. But space, yeah, depends on the point of view. It can be egocentric or allocentric or subjective or intersubjective. And that consciousness or awareness nowadays, we call it, uh, can be in different ways, uh, depending on the memory system that you're referring. It can be semantic awareness, episodic awareness, noetic awareness, procedural awareness, and so on and so forth. Now, I promised the diagram of the it. This is a very interesting thing. I hope uh, some of the Persian nerds out there were waiting for this. So I will be just uh, briefly reviewing it. I want to expl explain it. I will be just uh, showing how cool this and mysterious this thing is and how it can somehow help us to continue researching this craziness that is time. Now, in this diagram written in or designed in 1859, we have this uh, first called it the diagram of the eat. I don't have an idea what he meant by it. Uh, but according to the editor, so let's read what the editor wrote about this model. This very carefully drawn diagram of material categories appears on a separate sheet in manuscripts, whatever, where it follows a section entitled Explanation of the Categories. It is an early attempt at one of Peirce's greatest concerns during his early metaphysical period. And for reference, blah, 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 blah. blah. So in other words, this is directly connected to Peirce's metaphysical, sorry, to Peirce's scientific metaphysics. And in my opinion, is one of the uh, most overlooked or underestimated pieces of work in, in Peirce. I will make a close up now uh, that doesn't receive the attention it should. Maybe it's too early in Peirce's uh, work. Maybe that's why it's kind of immature. People don't take it as like the late Peirce, like the official version of Peirce. But nonetheless, the part that I'm interested, I interested in is this, as I already mentioned, this part of the it that is consciousness, space, and time. And for our structuralist friends out there, check this out. There is notion, substance, and form, right? Anyhow, uh, now let's go to this other part of the diagram that I uh, basically already show you, but in a different type of uh, wording. So according to Peirce, there are three different temporal expressions of stage, the precedence, contemporaneity, and succedence, or succession, I think it's the right word. Precedence, contemporaneity, and, suc and succession. OK, again, I invite you to check out my thesis, where I go a bit more into depth and came up with this type of approach that I call chronosemantics, chronosyntactics, and chronopragmatics. But basically, uh, yeah, are a bit of a expansion of these three things and how we can link them with episodic memory studies. And this is what I called the thirdness, firstness, secondness extrapolation. This is like my mental time travel machine, this thing right here. Anyhow, so I should wrap it up, right? OK, very good. I will just give the examples a bit later. I will just show you this quote. I promise it's the final quote for today. If you allow me, I will read it. Because it somehow summarizes the spirit of the, of the Sinekeia. Uh, topic of this series. 
and my presentation. So uh, this is a, uh, yeah, just, I'll just read it. According to Peirce, he says, I may mention that my chief advocation in the last 10 years has been to develop my cosmology. This theory is that the evolution of the world is hyperbolic. That is, proceeds from one state of things in the infinite past to a different state of things in the infinite future. The state of things in the infinite past is chaos. Oh my God, I don't know how to pronounce this. Tohu bohu? <laughs> oh, how? Say, say it again, please. Tohu bohu. Tohu The nothingness of which consists in the total absence of regularity. The state of things in the infinite future is death. The nothingness of which consists in the complete triumph of law and absence of all spontaneity. Between this, we have on our side a state of things in which there is some absolute spontaneity counter to all law and some degree of conformity to law, which is constantly on the increase owing to the growth of habit. The tendency to form habits or tendency to generalize is something which grows by its own action, by the habit of by the habit of taking habits itself growing. And this could have been taken from dark uh, as a quote of one of the characters. No problem. And finally, 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 uh, I also mentioned in my abstract that Peirce is being rediscovered in many different scientific fields. One of them is quantum mechanics mm -hmm. and relational physics. So here you have some papers highlighted in green that uh, are looking at Peirce and his scientific metaphysics at his evolutionary cosmology and somehow two semiotics to account for some types of relationships in science systems, sorry, in physical systems, which I insist take into account nowadays an observer, some subjective perspective, some measurement, in other words, some interpreter, some scientists making the interpretations of the physical systems. And I should wrap it up. Thank you for your time. I will leave you with this beautiful quote. The only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. Thank you very much. So please bring it on if any time. Right. Uh, you, I'm going to ask the question there also. Uh, or or did, uh, do they are here? Okay. Very well. okay. Okay. Um, okay, so first, how dare you talk about time and not mention Dr. Who? I mean, uh, what, are, what, what do you think about it? I can be a fan only of three franchises at the same time. Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, now, the very question I had was about um, all the category you present about the different kind of perception of time. Uh, I think it was. No, 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 uh, no, uh, quite beginning, uh, the, 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 no, before, 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 where was it? Um, what was in the slide? Uh, when you oh. talk about the three different, this, this are uh -huh. feeling and so on. Yeah. Uh, so do you think it's a kind of gradual thing, like you can have a bit of this feeling or it's one feeling you have it or you don't have it. And I will give you the concrete example I have in mind for this question. Uh, people that are affected with Alzheimer disease and that are losing perception of time. And interestingly, they are also at the same time losing perception of space. So there is also again a, a link between the two. Do you think that this loss is, uh, I would say a whole that like they are losing abilities and at some point they have these abilities and suddenly disappear because it's at a, a kind of age? Or do you think that it's an ability that you can have a bit and they are losing it gradually and they have a bit of this feeling and a bit of this conscience and gradually they are less and less of it remaining? Uh, okay, I think I have something to share, okay. but it's not necessarily related with Alzheimer. Yeah, it was the yeah. example I had in mind. Yeah, there is another example that I would like to use. So in episodic memory studies, there is a thing that is a hypocampal apnesia. That is the patient's inability to recall the past and imagine the future, 
because they have lost basically the hypocampal structures that provide the, with the neurobiological basis for performing mental time travel. And this basically means that the patient not only loses episodic memory, but it also loses the metaphysical awareness of time uh, in, the, in the sense that he's no longer able to control uh, or direct these bidirectional states of projecting his egocentric perspective in time and space. So what this uh, I'm trying to say is that it is an instantaneous loss of feeling. Uh, maybe it's gradual in the sense that the, the disease, the hippocampal apnesia, maybe the hippocampus is gradually deformed or uh, infected in this case, and they eventually lose it. But I think at some point it becomes instantaneous. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's there a kind of no return point where the brain is not able to compensate for something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in that sense, the material causes of memory, if removed, instantaneously will imply the, lo the loss of the final causes, uh, manipulating these material causes, but not the other way around. Uh, meaning that if uh, you have like a personality disorder, or if even you have like some sort of like other neuro neurocognitive uh, disorder that doesn't involve the loss of these material causes, then you might come back to that previous state if you get healthier. And I don't know how mental health works there, but uh, that's a very interesting question. We need mental health people here to, to ask. Uh, no? Actually, it's always interesting to uh, <laughs> study something at the moment we start to dysfunction. It's, it's generally the most interesting part. Mm. Yeah, totally. Very good. Uh, <laughs> do we have any more questions? So, great presentation, Oscar. And uh, I wanted to ask about this chaotic uh, function of time because, like in every uh, time traveling series, there's this there there's this chaos when there is a time traveling. I mean, in dark, like when the the main character's father commits suicide because of the because of the time loop, and like how do, how do you find the chaotic function of time? I mean, How the, do I the, god, the, the, the god of uh, the god of time in Greek mythology was chaotic. So. Okay, I don't know. I don't know. I won't answer your question because I don't know. Uh, okay. I will have I will have to to watch Dark again. Uh, but I can tell you this uh, that came to my mind. So I mentioned that logic and time are like one side of the same coin. Do two sides of the same coin. Uh, and this is not a coincidence in terms of like the history of philosophy. And this permeates in dark and like uh, science fiction and media culture, they go by this sort of intuition that logic and time are like somehow connected. So disrupting time would in somehow disrupt logic. And for Peirce, uh, logic is somehow the matrix from which reality springs. So in that sense, uh, I would argue that Peirce was more agapistic and synechistic than tychistic. So he was more with the God of love and more with the God of continuity rather than with the God of chaos or tychism in his own words. But this is um, yeah, my personal uh, interpretation. Thank you. And uh, do we have uh, some questions from people online? So, uh, Owen Screw. Uh, hi, Oscar, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you for a brilliant presentation. Uh, I can see you did a lot of uh, reading of first versus manuscripts. That was excellent uh, research in all your lists. I really took some notes. Thank you for that. And I have, um, I don't know if this is a question, but I have an observation because I saw you connected uh, time, space, and mind in your final diagram. But I have uh, this thing I, I found in the first in Lady Victoria, well, by um, 
communication, you know, about that interesting, very interesting thing uh, where first states that he actually, he doesn't think there's connection between time and space or whether he, he says that this connection is language dependent or that if we didn't have like human language uh, and he uses the word uh, speech, communication, linguistic, symbolic communication, there wouldn't be a connection of time and space for us because the only connection according to person in this very uh, text is that it's language um, somehow dependent because we only linguistically relate space and time with lexicon saying something is distant or close in both time and space. But so this is very interesting to me. And in the later correspondence, Lady Will Buy replies, she she doesn't really understand what he's talking about. And so there was no further clarification because she she didn't catch the idea. She didn't like this. And I wanted to know what your opinion is on that, whether you found in other Percy's texts something similar. And so whether you might agree, since you are you know, doing research in animals, what is your opinion that whether this connection between time and space is somehow um, human species specific? Or because you know you said there animals, do you have some kind of memory? that is it related to spatial to organization or spatial uh, understanding of space in, in animals? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question and uh, comment. Yes, I'm thinking of an example, bats. Uh, so it was discovered just recently, I think last year, that echolocating bats don't think of space in terms of like distance, but in terms of timing. So they encode the, uh, their sonar, their collocation. Uh, they codify it by birth uh, in terms of timing. So they anticipate the timing and according to the synchronization of these timings, they can learn uh, when to stop and when to move. So I would say that in this case, uh, I don't know if that means that bats somehow codify time and, and space in the same a modeling system that would be a very interesting thing to explore so i don't know and secondly regarding like this language like by linguistic bias yes actually purse uh, in other manuscripts he says that saying that time is continuous because it has no stops it is like empty language so we need like a natural philosophy of time that is able to account logically for the fact that time uh somehow is continuous, but at the same time, it is uh, how, how, this hyperbolic continuum that is never reaching a liminal phase where he can like uh, make like a loop. Uh, so in other words, there are more questions that I can uh, answer, but that's a definitely good topic to look into next time. Uh, yeah, the linguistic bias, I would say. Maybe in other cultures, um, different time tenses, different ways of uh, speaking about time. Maybe there is a different type of phenomenology of time, right? Even in episodic memory studies, in the case of humans, depending on the language that you speak, is somehow how you report uh, your mental time travel. So that also influences this thing. But I would go with Einstein and argue that space-time is a continuum that uh, we can somehow infer, yeah. <laughs> Uh, very good. Uh, so there is one uh, comment for you in the chat. Oh yeah, uh, by Amelia. Good friend, Amelia. Um, I don't know. Oh, okay, okay. Let me Yeah, I guess it depends on the species. I guess it depends on the uh, the paradigm. So in the case of, sorry for bringing this all the time up, but it's my topic, uh, the way that I research time is through episodic memory. But in the case of episodic memory, so far we know that uh, great apes, rodents, uh, avian species, and humans, by the way, uh, we can actually 
encode time in episodic memory. And we basically do it uh, not through an homologous system, but an analog system. Um, but I would say that in this case, the time is one of the main variables of the experiments, not the independent one. I don't know if that's, um, yeah, because time in the end will depend on the external point of view of the experimenter, of the scientist taking the time of like this long-term perspective or long-term retrospection indeed. So I agree with that. But in terms of the phenomenological time, like internally perceived time from the perspective of the animal, I would say that we can always, that's a, more or less a topic of my thesis, we can go into that by modeling it semiotically. But anyhow, thanks for the question and comment. I think that's it, right? Thanks for joining us from Mexico, whoever came from Mexico and other <laughs> countries in the world. Yeah. So, yeah, we have uh, Ignacio from Mexico who was here last time uh, for something. Yeah, just let me retrieve my USB. Don't worry. Uh, so, in the meantime, uh, yeah, so, yes. So very good. So uh, next week, no, not next week. Uh, two, weeks. two weeks from now, we will have our final. Um, we will have our final uh, session of uh, this semester's Samuel Salong, and uh, we will have uh, two good friends, uh, Jeremy Sherman, and. Uh, uh, just a second, just a second. We'll have uh, Jeremy Sherman and Vit uh, Gvozdiak. Uh, uh, they will be our, our last uh, presenters, and uh, we are very happy because, uh, uh, well, we have been listening to, to Jeremy's uh, work and because of his involvement with, with Deacon and I personally. Uh, I remember uh, uh, Vit from. Uh, uh, one of the international uh, congresses, I think it was the one in Lithuania, and uh, I'm really eager to, to, to yeah, uh, listen to, to what he has to say on, on the topic we chose for this semester long. Uh, so, yeah, and, and of course, so th thanks again uh, to all of you, our participants and uh, the attendants. Uh, thanks to Amelia, who is always here. And I hope uh, uh, next uh, semester she can really join us uh, as a presenter. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, um, well, uh, I guess this is all for me now. And uh, then uh, see you in two weeks. So, yep, thank you. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs>